Welcome, everyone. I'm grateful to see so many friendly faces here at the monthly Psychedelic Support Speaker Series. And while I can't actually see you, we know that you're all here, and we hope that you will introduce yourself in the chat as we like to help people make connections here. So you're welcome uh, to do that. It's on the side panel. Also, another note, if there may be time for questions at the end. I'm not sure, but if you want to drop those into the QA section in the bottom of your dashboard, we'll take a look there. We will be recording the session, and after we'll share the video in an email to everyone who registered, or you can check it out on our page along with our upcoming and past speakers. We'll post the video here for you, putting some links now. Uh, you can also receive continuing education credits for many of our webinars, which is also in the link I just shared. Uh, so with that, I'm Dr. Allison Fiducia, a neuropharmacologist and co-founder of Psychedelic Support. I find great joy in hosting these webinars, and especially our special guest today came highly recommended. And after learning more about Dr. Sapiro, I have been looking forward to hosting this event for some time now. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll be talking about truth medicine, a non-dual approach to psychedelic psychotherapy. And Michael Sapiro is a clinical psychologist, psychedelic psychotherapist, writer, meditation teacher, researcher, and a former Buddhist monk with over 25 years of training in both traditional yoga philosophy and Buddhist meditation. He is a transformational coach for world-renowned musicians, veterans, athletes, scientists, authors, and playwrights. And currently he's writing a book about psychedelic psychotherapy, which we'll be hearing about some of the concepts that will be presented in this book. Uh, we'll be talking about those today. He has extensive training in many other disciplines and currently works on as an integrative psychologist at the Boise, Idaho Ketamine Clinic, where he offers ketamine assisted psychotherapy sessions for first responders, veterans, and community members. His work is dedicated to personal awakening for the sake of collective and planetary transformation. If you want to learn more about his work in offerings, uh, this was just a short snippet of what he does. I highly encourage you to check out his website and follow him on these social media channels. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop those in the chat where you can learn more. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Sapir. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome. <clears throat> really excited to be here and, and share some of my work with you. Um, the, the person I just want to make a real quick statement, uh, he's here in the waiting room. I mean, in the list. So if we can get him as a co-host or something, so later I can have him read. His name is Brian Zahn right there, a couple, uh, couple up. And then we'll get, and he'll come on a little bit later to read something for us. Well, I really wish I could see all of you. I, I would love to see your faces as we go through this uh, experience together. What I hope it leaves you feeling inspired to maybe think a little differently about psychedelic psychotherapy, the, a, a way you can bring in unconditional love to your practice as one of the most important medicines that we have. Um, she did a great job of introducing me, so I don't want to spend too much more time talking about myself, but I think what's relevant is I do individual ketamine sessions. Um, I do group ketamine with a co-teacher, uh, Radha Webner, and then I lead retreats, both ceremonial and therapeutic retreats. And so um, I'm going to be hopefully talking about each different form of psychedelic therapy and psychedelic psychotherapy. My main focus is first responders and combat veterans, although I do see a wide variety of populations, but I focus a lot of time on police, wellness, fire, wildland fire, and veterans from a number of different eras. And uh, if we're able to, I'm gonna bring one of those uh, dudes in at the very end to share something we worked on. Um, so I actually want us to start with an experience because I believe it's the most powerful way of learning some things by doing it. And also because we're all frazzled with the state of the world. So even just a fast five minute meditation for peace can help us stabilize, which may have a, a small impact, but a necessary one as uh, the world is, is feeling 
dismayed and horrified with the current situation in the Middle East. So I just want us to have a moment that we can settle into ourselves and also touch upon unconditional love as a way that will bring through our uh, the thread. So it won't be that long, but I think as a group, we can build up some, some power together. If you're willing to do a meditation, and you don't have to, of course, you can just sit and breathe and rest for a moment. But as a group, if we can gently close our eyes, and those of you who would prefer not to, keep them open, slightly open. And before doing anything funky or weird or special, just pay attention to what's here, your body, the position of your body, What are your feet touching? The ground, shoes, the floor. So pay attention to the feeling and position of your body. And as a group, let's take a slow, deep breath in. And sigh. Sigh down the body, through the body, seat bones, backs of the legs, bottom of the feet. And return to a natural breath. Let's take another sigh. So breathe in. And sigh out. Returning to a natural breath. Bring your mind's attention into the body. And feel the presence of your own body. One more deep, slow breath in. Hold the breath. Another deep breath in here. Hold the breath. and slowly exhale down the body. Feel the body's response. The slowing down of time, the shift in perception. and return to a slow, gentle breath. And now in your mind, in the space of imagination, bring an image of whatever evokes the sense of love or unconditional love. So it could be a person, a child, an animal, a place, Bring to mind that which evokes unconditional love. And feel your body's response. Keep in mind this person or place or animal. Feel how alive love feels in the body. And now extend this love, this field of love to one another here in the group. As if expanding a blanket at a picnic so everyone could sit on it. Keep the image in mind that brings you love. And expand it throughout our video to one another. All of us creating a field, a sense of unconditional love. And in the middle of this field or blanket or web, let us put everyone that is suffering, that is hurting. Those who need strength of heart and resiliency 
those who are being wounded by violence, put them in the field. And let us also put those who are causing violence, those who are causing harm, put them in the field as well, that their hearts may soften, that hatred dissolves. And any hatred or anger you still carry in your life, Put that in the field as well. So our own hearts soften. And take a slow, deep breath into this moment. And exhale softly. And without losing this embodied presence, gently open the eyes, taking another full deep breath, even we cannot see one another, we can feel one another. And without losing this sense, if you can write your experience into the chat window, a word or a phrase what you're feeling or sitting with so that we can see the impact of this practice. Mm. And just feel these words as you're reading them. And that might have been five or six minutes, I didn't time it, but look at the difference. The concentrated awareness and bringing unconditional love brings to us. Mm, thank you all for doing this for the sake of the world and each other. Imagine if this is the basis of our therapy, that we take these feelings through every part of our healing and growth process. So thank you for writing. So I'm just gonna start, I don't really use slides. I hope that's okay. I have a few to share with you, but really it's gonna be an experience of listening, usually sharing back and forth, but today mostly just listening and I'll have you write things too. So a felt sense of peace and connection. This is literally what non-dual psychedelic psychotherapy is aiming for. A sense of unconditional love that is radiant as a field, not just human to human love, like with a lover, a friend, or a, a child, but the field of love. And we drop into that field and we ourselves become open, relaxed, peaceful, and connected. So the way I work in psychedelic psychotherapy is I bring people to this state first and foremost to touch upon that, which what we're all longing for. And then we work through the layers of our trauma, depression, anxiety, memories, personality, traits and issues. We're bringing all of this feeling of connectedness to us, with us through the healing because so many therapies, we want to get here and we do everything we can over weeks, months, and years to have us touch this. But I was discovering throughout a long-term meditation practice and psychedelic psychotherapy practice, as well as regular therapy. What if we touch this first? What if this is available to us in the very present moment as it is for most of us right now, and we carry that through with us throughout the entire treatment. Instead of doing a whole treatment that doesn't really start here, but maybe ends here. So that's where we're gonna be going today. I, I know I think, Allison, we only have an hour, right? Is that right? It's not like a two hour, oh my gosh. So, okay. 
there's a lot to cover here and hopefully a lot of uh, experience within you that you can take take with you to your practices. I want to talk about before I get into what is non duality, I want to say what my framework is for mental health, because uh, so just so you know I'm writing a book on psychedelic psychotherapy. I have a book deal with the Mayo Clinic Press and uh, I don't have the subtitle but it's called truth medicine is the title and it's going to come out late next year, hopefully, and it's about my process of doing psychedelic psychotherapy, which is different than psychedelic therapy. Where we give people medicine and the medicine and their innate healers work together or the innate healing intelligence. I'm actually doing psychotherapy the whole time. Now, when I'm on retreat and I have 16 or 20 vets or first responders, of course, I'm not engaging while they're on medicine unless they need to be pulled out. Uh, but I do engage in uh, non-dual psychotherapy during the retreat. And one of my guys is here. He's going to share something with you at the end um, that we did. But uh, my book is really about what am I doing during ketamine sessions with my patients. And the non-dual framework that I'm bringing is what I'm going to teach you today. But the, my basis for understanding mental health disorders like depression and anxiety uh, I don't really believe in them as a kind of a concretized disorder. I think they really arise in response to us as people being misaligned with who we are supposed to be. It is my belief and also my experience personally and then watching thousands of people through my work um, more often than not feeling I don't feel like myself. I don't feel like I'm supposed to feel something is off. I'm not living my life. I'm living someone else's life. And when I do some really deep digging, what I find is that people are living in personas of who they're thinking they're supposed to be. And that is really depressing. I mean, literally depressing of our own soul or psyche's unique potential to flourish. But it's also depressing in terms of, you know, energy and lethargy and sleeplessness and it also causes lots of anxiety to try to live up to other people's expectations and other people's ideas of who we're supposed to be so the basis of my work kind of is built on the idea that most people are misaligned with what they're doing and how they're being with who they actually are and that causes a myriad of mental health concerns so i started working with the concept of truth as medicine and of course, we're all here for psychedelic medicine. And what I found is that ketamine is like a truth serum. People years ago, I discovered, because I was doing this for quite, quite many years, that people started speaking their truth in sessions. Like, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with how my mom, dad, caregiver, whatever, did this or that thing or treated me or taught me. I'm not okay with the clergy I grew up with or the community or teachers actually putting these messages of who I'm supposed to be onto myself. And I said, if you could be anything without barriers or boundaries, who, who would show up in the world? And when they finally felt brave or courageous or safe enough to express themselves, I found that speaking the truth was actually the best medicine, but even more potent was the unconditional love that flooded them for saying those things. So in my work, I really focus heavily on truth telling, truth speaking, truth acting and I also then that leads to authenticity so I believe that authenticity is one of the most important keys to sustained mental health really being ourselves acting in ways that are aligned with our own psyche soul or heart um, and of course psychedelic medicine is perfect for that because it just so easily dissolves all those defenses that get in the way of speaking our truth we're scared to we've denied it for so long we've repressed it we're embarrassed we're ashamed all of those things that we've kind of learned to suppress who we are are now are, are unlocked we can start saying them we feel safe to because i'm starting off with this basis of unconditional love where they feel held and supported within themselves to start speaking their truth. So my book is called Truth Medicine because I believe the truth is medicine and that psychedelic medicine unlocks the potential for us speaking, living, and um, being our truths in the world. Um, I'm wondering how that's sitting with you. Um, can you put a few thoughts in the chat window? What is that? Yeah, truth serum. What I, I We didn't want to call it truth serum because I do work with the military. We don't want it to be like really thought of as like, um, you know, some kind of torture or like information get gathering. 
Um, so can you put some ideas of what you're thinking about? Yeah. Just a few more ideas what this sparks in you as, as maybe practitioners or as people who are taking medicine. And truth, it's interesting because in my book, I, I was really nervous to write about truth because how dare I? What do I know about truth? Yeah, I'm a, I was a Buddhist monk. I've studied for almost 30 years now. Um, and I have a deep sense of the Dharma, which is universal truth. But truth are not preferences. Truth are not beliefs. When you hear truth within yourself, it rings like a bell. There's no denying it. That is medicine for us. Truth is anchoring. I like that. It does set us free, literally. Uh, acceptance is a big part of our work here. Accepting whatever arises. Now I'm going to switch to non-duality because acceptance will play in that. It looks like you're all you're are like, oh, this is working some way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, while being safe. Safety is so important. And I don't know if it's Ali or Ali, but Ali or Ali. Um, the idea of safety is so important, and that's why I touch upon um, this unconditional love immediately, because it creates a, a container where we can kind of dissolve uh, right in the moment, but knowing we're held. And if any of you have done ketamine, it's very non-duality is very close to a, a deep ketamine experience where all of your boundaries dissipate, but you're still aware of existence. You're still conscious but yourself, your body, your ideas, your even idea of self dissipates. So let's talk about non-duality. Ooh, Jeff, I don't know what that means. I wish we had a moment I would go, what does that mean, unconscious truth? Most, that's a good, that's, I'm gonna show you a slide of unconsciousness. Allie, thank you, Allie. Okay, so non-duality, if you haven't heard the term, it actually comes essentially from the Rig Vedas, which are yogic texts, Vedic texts back from about 15 to 2000 BC. Um, it talks about both the container, which is the universe and all the phenomenon which arises in the universe. And this is important, especially for ketamine. Um, in non-duality, you have the formless field. Like in quantum physics, everything is potential until it arises as an event. In spiritual life, too, everything is a potential. We know nothing what's coming into our consciousness while on medicine until it appears. So what is the space that holds all the potential? In non-duality, we call that pure consciousness or cosmic consciousness. And whatever arises is the form. So in non-duality, we work bit, both with this formlessness and the form that arises. Most of us identify so much with our form, our body, which has disorders and disease, our mind, which has preferences and beliefs and values, and we, we, that becomes concretized. Mike is this, Allison is that, Brian is that, Muslims are this, Jews are that, you know, queer people are this, straight people are that. We get into this concept and then those with power use those concepts to do things and marginalize and oppress. And we have so much, so much suffering in the world at a universal quantum physical spiritual level. There's formlessness from which everything arises and that arising is just form sensation material. And we, we, in that spaciousness, we don't get caught in anything. We don't get caught in our identity, which if you've ever taken ketamine, your identity tends to dissolve. And what you learn there is what I'm not all my pain. I'm not my memories. I'm not simply my trauma. I'm so much more. Non-duality is both this and that. The actual term Advaita means not two, not two. And I'm, I don't just say oneness because that's a fad kind of statement that we all use. Everything is one. but when you actually experience non-duality, you are both the field, which is formless and shapeless, and you are also everything that arises in it. And how this works in psychedelic psychotherapy is we're able to guide our patients or clients into an experience that is so big beyond themselves 
that the attachment to their own pain and suffering and, and the dwelling in pity and shame, it literally dissolves into the space and it gives them complete freedom for that moment, at least, to identify with something that is universal and as spacious as the cosmos itself, which is complete freedom. This is one of my clients here when we led her, led her through. Um, there is power in disidentifying from personal history because it allows me to imagine being free, to feel what it's like to be free. Touching the cosmos, which is also non-dual awareness, expands my identity to include more than just my history. It's very healing. It's very valuable when trauma embraces me. It provides a safe haven. It provides a space in which I can reinvent myself in a way I want rather than how I was conditioned to be. This is her, this is someone who was highly traumatized as a child, father putting guns in her face, her feeling threatened and having to escape, having to deal with, um, she's from South America, um, um, sexism, patri the strong patriarchy, and then exiled from her homeland because she had to escape. And she finally found a freedom that was bigger than, as she talks about her own history and trauma, which can tend to uh, smother her. And so um, non-dual psychotherapy, non-dual psychedelic th psychotherapy really helps people accept what's arising, whether that be chronic pain, emotional psychological pain, memories of pain, memories of themselves being hurt, but also have a great big spaciousness around it. One example, I, I worked with someone who is agoraphobic with panic attacks. She was afraid to go out in public for being embarrassed, saying stupid things. I mean, this got her, she was so, uh, so uh, smothered in her agoraphobia and panic, she would turn back from going to work because she was afraid of saying stupid things at work and that she was going to be uh, laughed at, ostracized. So she would often call her supervisor and get allowed to work at home. This had gone on for years and years, and I had seen her for three years. And honestly, in normal, regular therapy, I we even with mindfulness weren't breaking through in any way. And so I, I asked her to if she was interested in ketamine therapy. And uh, one of her sessions she had, she was smothered in a marshmallow, like a marshmallow state, you know, the puff from Ghostbusters, that big marshmallow man was smothering her. And I wondered aloud if that's what agoraphobia felt like. And she said, exactly, this is my normal waking state, I'm smothered. And as ketamine often does, everything shifts and changes. There's nothing stable as in life. Um, and so I asked her to expand, go back, because we practiced this non-dual practice in the beginning where she saw stars and the universe. So I asked her in that moment where the marshmallow is smothering her, could you expand yourself as well? And she was able to consciously expand herself and see again the universe with stars and spaciousness. And I asked her where the marshmallow was, and she goes, it was just a small regular marshmallow at that point. So I asked her to continue working between opposites, which we do a lot in non-duality, this and that, we hold space for both. So she went back and forth between smothered and conscious spacious awareness, which is full of like love and peace, back to the marshmallow, back and forth, where the marshmallow became just a part of the scene. Not a big thing, not even a small thing, but a part of the experience. And so then we wonder, how does this happen? What happens in real life? Because that's more, more important than even in our session. She said she was standing at her refrigerator. Um, she opened the refrigerator door and had that panicky feeling because she had to go do some work, had a panicky feeling arise. And everything started to, you know, when you're panicking, shift in perception. And what she did was she grounded herself and brought her attention to the whole kitchen, expanded her attention to the whole space, to the whole house, to the neighborhood. And then the fridge and her panic subsided into just part of life. Within literally, I'm not joking, within months of doing this therapy, she was going to parties. She told her boss she didn't want to do that job and did it started a new job within the same department. She went to concerts. 
I mean, this is a woman who would hardly leave her house. Uh, Non-dual psychedelic psychotherapy allowed her to expand into what is naturally spacious around her so that her panic, which still arises, is in the context of something much greater, full of peace and full of love. We're never going to be complete. I don't think we're going to be completely free from the anxiety, depressions, lethargy, panic that arises human beings, but we can have a new relationship to what arises with it based on the spaciousness of non-dual presence that we, we, we build ourselves into in our therapy. So how, what are you thinking now? What are some thoughts on that one? Why ketamine? I love that question because, well, I work with all kinds of other medicines. One, it's legal. Two, I'm working at a clinic and I have a whole team with me and, you know, we can measure dose and it's safe and we have protocols. I do all kinds of other work and I try to have that be true. But honestly, and maybe Allison can speak to this too, but for me, I've worked with all the medicines and done many of the medicines since I was 15 years old. And there's something about ketamine I, I see it as relaxing, re, reducing noise and the parasympathetic state of the nervous system is able to take over and you can do the work even if there's fear without freaking out. You do dissolve, there's edges of dissolving where psilocybin tends to be activating and those mushroom spirits are really tricksters and they want to mess with you. Ketamine tends to help you have this non-dual spacious awareness in which you see your everything all at once and you're also yourself, but you're not. I really like it because for first responders and veterans and anybody with trauma, it really helps reduce the, um, the agitation of a sympathetic nervous system and chronic stress. So I prefer to use ketamine, but it's also one of the clearest non-dual experiences I've had outside of my meditation practice. Yes, there's great evidence on ketamine too. And, and Allison's psychedelic support has a ton of great things you can watch on ketamine therapy and why it's so useful. Uh, any other thoughts on that? Just on the idea of non-dual. Repairing the pot of self-worth. Yeah, yeah, I like that. We're actually going to what is good in us. I was sitting with my ex-wife, she's pregnant, and we were having lunch and I and I asked her, what's it, does she feel the consciousness of her baby? What's the essence like? And she said, I, she goes, I don't know. And I said, what does it feel like? And she goes, she put her hand on her belly and she goes, pure and soft. And that's like the essence I've been helping people get to in themselves. How many of us as children have lost our innocence because of the traumas or the way we've been raised or because of circumstances, but our actual radiant original essence is pure and soft. And so why don't we touch that and bring that through with us while going through the hard steps of trauma, treatment, depression, anxiety, all that stuff. So how does one deal with it? Well, we'll get to questions in a little bit, Frank. Hey, how, that's a good one. Put that in the Q&A, Frank, so we can get back to that. So great. Uh, Carol just asked, how much does this connect with spirit, angels, etc.? I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to touch on that right now. Okay. Here you go. This is from a paper on a post-materialist model of consciousness, and I love using it. I'm a fellow at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, so I use this slide a lot in my work. Um, this top of the iceberg, the supraliminal, is really what we would call intrapersonal or personal. This is where our temperament, personality, personality traits, our preferences, beliefs, our experiences, our history, all personal reside. If I meet you, a person B, I'm person A, I'm immediately going to notice you're not Mike Shapiro. You're somebody else, looks different, talks different, sounds different, has a complete different identity, different history, culture, language, whatever. So we have this kind of, there's a seeming difference. This subliminal self is what Jung or Jung might have called the collective unconscious. And this is the realm in which metaphor, symbol, images, archetypes, iconography, 
cause uh, like cause the the material of the cosmic shows up. This is the level of ancestors when our ancestors show up when spirits guides uh, ghosts. That's when that shows up in a psychedelic work. So I am working on that level as well. Um, this is across culture and time. You can find that's what archetypes are. They're kind of personality motifs that exist across culture and time. Um, they exist on this uh, subliminal level. And that definitely comes out. This is uh, in our treatment. And then the bottom, what, what, what this author called common ground is actually what I, um, I, I and my teacher, Richard Miller of IREST call uh, the ground of being. This is the formlessness, the formless ground of being. In quantum physics, this is like a field of potentiality before anything actually uh, becomes an event. It's a potential. This is what contains the radiant sense of unconditional love and peace that is independent of war and, and independent of wealth. It's, it's independent of any factor because it's pre-matter. It is consciousness that exists beyond matter. And so what I'm doing is starting here, moving through this up. Rather than starting on this level, I'm starting on this level and I'm moving through back to the personal, carrying the essence of the source of life, of the mystery through to the people's hearts where that's when we spend most work. Um, so yes, spirits exist in here, but this is, this is kind of, I love this image to show you the different levels of consciousness that exist simultaneously. And non-duality supposes that all of this exists at the same time. And as a psychedelic therapist, I'm using all of this information at the same time to help meet their healing and transformation goals. Okay. Cool. Lori, that's a question for uh, Allison. And you can, add, you in the, again, really great. So uh, we're going to, before we go to Q&A, uh, I do a lot of lo stuff on love. Love, I believe, is the, the purest medicine, self-love, unconditional love being accessible. Self-love is difficult, but we grow into self-love. Self-love is not evident. It's not, it's not um, given. Most of us struggle to love ourselves. Unconditional love has no conditions. Self-love is difficult. And so I spend a lot of time early on in my treatments building up self-love practices. Whether they feel it or not in the beginning is not as important as whether they're practicing touching upon love. And so at the end of a four-day veteran retreat, I ha and there were only guys at this one. I had all the guys write a love letter to themselves. I wrote one to myself when I was 40 and I showed it to them as a model and they took time and wrote it to themselves. They spent a whole weekend doing medicine and non-dual therapy um, activities, meditation, body movement, breath, but always starting from that radiant heart moving out. And so I just happened, one of my guys has said he's coming today and his was the letter I was going to read. And he's, and we talked about having him read it. Um, it's going in my book and it's one of the most powerful testaments uh, I've ever come across of the power of love. So uh, Brian, are you willing and able? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I don't to, know if you can see me. We can. All right. Great. Uh, so yeah, I'll read. I'll read the letter, Doctor Mike. But before that, I, I guess what I'd like to say is that uh, I had the opportunity to attend uh, one of Doctor Mike's and the Sable Group's um, retreats back in April of this year. It was based on a recommendation of a friend of mine who had attended one in uh, Texas a year earlier. And that was perhaps the best advice I've ever received from anyone I've ever known at any time, because he talked a lot about this weekend being a life changer for him. And I took that with a grain of salt because uh, being somewhat of a skeptic, I just said, well, yeah, true. There's, there are 
truly no life changers in a three or four day weekend. Um, but after having recently retired after 40 plus years uh, in the army uh, and not a good candidate for retirement uh, because it happened right as I stepped out of retirement into COVID. And so there were a lot of things going on that I wasn't very happy with. And um, I was dealing with a lot of anger issues at the time that I think sort of drove me into dealing with some alcohol issues. And uh, so um, I decided to go based on my friend's recommendation. It was probably one of the best decisions I've uh, ever made. The letter that Dr. Mike talked about that he wrote to himself at 40 really brought something to uh, really turn on a light bulb in my mind. Uh, because in those 40 plus years, uh, I always looked at the army being more about others than about self. Um, I thought about the army being people that I either served with, uh, that had the opportunity to follow or the opportunity to lead. And it was, I never took the time really to think about self. And I had already gotten to that point uh, by about day three of the weekend. And when he read that letter, I said, man, that's, that's it. And so I wrote this, this letter to myself and, uh, thought it pretty well summed up where I am at my point in life. And like everyone, the, the letter was entitled letter to Brian. And I just said, um, I must say that I'm surprised that it's taken nearly 70 years to come to love the man that Brian has always been. While I've always liked who I am, I never have gotten close enough to myself to actually fall in love. As a result, I've missed out on so much compassion, joy, and happiness that could otherwise have been. But now in this 70th year, I've been blessed to be introduced to a heavenly group of people that helped me find new purpose for the autumn of my life. I intend to go back to work utilizing my creative skills and I know that it will not only help serve others, but will unlock my mind and soul and restore the joy that's been missing for the past few years. Thanks for doing this, Brian, I love you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's it. Um, but I talked about the heavenly group of people and I gotta tell you that if you ever have the opportunity to join one of these retreats, you will not regret it. Uh, and I say heavenly because it's not only about uh, Dr. Mike, and the staff who truly were, but the other six guys that I got to know probably as well as I've known others after having known them for, for years and in three or four short days, uh, I'm still very close to these guys and we stay in touch on signal. Um, and, and I don't think that would have happened without that weekend. So thanks for this opportunity, Dr. Mike, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing. That letter has brought a lot of people to tears and I share it with a lot of my uh, veterans who are retiring and my first responders and all of them come to tears because of it. Thank you for your vulnerability after such a long life of um, wearing armor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming on too. You bet. Duty first. Mm -hmm. And Brian, you might take a look at some of the chat window too, just to see the love that's pouring your way. That looks great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Mm. So we have about 15 minutes left and uh, I'd love to open it up to Q and A. Allison, if you're a good uh, co-host or whatever, work with me. Uh, sure, I'd be uh, happy to facilitate the questions here. If anyone wants to add one, please go ahead and drop it in the QA box. And um, as I'm pulling this up, I have one that comes to mind. In the diagram you showed, I see the arrows are going in one direction mm -hmm. uh, from the ground space. I'm just wondering if you feel that there is a bi-directional path of understanding as people sort of step through this process of knowing themselves or knowing the non-dual state more. Yeah, that's good. I didn't draw this diagram. So those arrows were built into that. Um, I do believe there's a bi-directionality. Although that being said, I don't know 
what impact we have on the source itself. You know, that's a spiritual question. Although it's a, that's a deep question. I do believe the arrows going between personal and subliminal go in both directions. We have actually some evidence that doing work with ancestors in, impacts our, our family and our actual present day health. It's really interesting when we do ancestral work and spiritual work, certainly with mediumship and, and looking at um, spirits doing work in that level, because psychedelics, whether we believe it or not, it certainly opens a door to it, doesn't it? Uh, what I love about writing for the Mayo Clinic is that I can talk about spirits and ancestors and I don't have to prove anything. Unlike my colleagues at IONS who have to prove what telepathy is scientifically, I just have to say, this is what arises in session. Spirits come, ancestors come, the source, you meet God, you become God. I don't have to prove any of it. These are experiences. But I believe, I probably would say in all honesty, every if our hearts are wide open, I bet you it impacts the source just as source impacts us. And I actually believe we are the source manifest in these bodies, living our lives, trying to harmonize. So that's a deep question. I love that question. I do think it's bi-directional. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for musing with me on that question. Um, so next we'll get to Chloe's question here. She's asking, or Chloe's asking, for someone interested in ketamine therapy who is low income, cannot afford health insurance, are there resources available to make it more affordable? Gosh, I hope and I wish. I do believe there's going to be codes in starting in January where people can start using insurance. I know that's not what you're asking yet, but that's a start because it's not really, we're not able to really bill yet. So that's a start to where we can get toward possibly Medicare, Medicaid. I don't know that at all at this point. I think there may be some clinics in Oakland that are for people who need resources. Um, do you know the name, Allison? I can't recall the name of the place uh, in Oakland. I thought there was a place in Oakland that serves low income. Me? Alchemy Institute is is one. It's formerly called Sage Institute. Yes, that, and, um, that was it. Yeah, I think they've there's there's the Sage Clinic and now the Alchemy Institute, uh, which I believe is using some of their trainees to help offer services to a more diverse group of people that may be more lower income. Yeah, um, and I I know too a lot of clinics will um, have a sliding scale, so it never mm -hmm. hurts to. I think reach out and just talk about your situation and see if there can be some assistance there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this one's actually in the chat from Jack. What's a quick way of leaving the mind chatter and accessing unconditional love? Um, think about, uh, let me see if I have it here. Oh, it's in another notebook. Hold on. And you're cutting off a little bit, Allison, too. All right. This is to answer. Fortunately, I think I'm having an internet issue. <laughs> yeah, you are. I can it's kind of choppy, but, uh, I have an answer to Jack's question. Can you see this? Draw your puppy. <laughs> That's my dog. If you want the quickest way, I mean, you can use your dog, but if you want the quickest way to drop into your heart space, grounding your body um, while breathing, feet on the ground, and bring to mind that which you feel safe, secure, or that which evokes unconditional love. And it could be your puppy, a cat, a child, a lover, a friend, an ancestor, a tree, a lake. Every one of us has touched unconditional love, hopefully many times. And this and heart math, by the way, I am a huge proponent of heart math. It's a really awesome uh, intervention, which I teach most of my first responders to drop into the heart space. I train them to feel the heartbeat. I also train my musicians to go right to the heartbeat. So if you can train yourself to feel your own heart beating in the chest, throat, eyes, while breathing, you immediately can drop in and then you can consciously go to gratitude, to acceptance, 
to compassion, whatever medicine you're choosing for that moment. But either using an image or going to the heartbeat are the two most quick ways that I uh, do this. Show us your dog. He's in another room, but if you couldn't see mm -hmm. that, that's my dog mm -hmm. sleeping. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I just dropped the link here to the Heart Math Institute. I'm not sure if any of uh, your work or teachings come from here, but it's they do some, some fascinating do. research there. Yeah, I'm trained. I'm trained in. Um... Oh, that's 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 a tough one. That's the hard one. If if your dog now, um, I I wish I could do work with you, but you we unpair trauma and grief. Those are two separate things. So you can actually use your dog and just stay in the grief, which is a home, which is love without a home, as they as they say. And that could be very hard up front. So you may use other things in your mind that are not paired with trauma until you can unpair trauma and the grief. Because you could use images that are grief laden, because grief is actually love. Most of us have so much untended grief. And a lot of my work is around untended grief, uh, but you do need to unpair it if there's trauma with it. But um, okay. Yeah, I think there's a good follow up question to this one. Um, how does one change the habits and addictions that develop to survive trauma? And what happens after the psychedelic experience? Yeah. So what I've learned personally, as someone who used a lot of drugs to deal with my life, and as a you know, a uh, uh, grown up who does this for a living, I still want to use drugs sometimes when I'm freaking out in my body or mind when I'm sensing and I'm like, Oh, I wish I could use that thing I used to use, which I've learned is my adolescent part, my adolescent self not really able to handle the um, intensity of the emotions that are surfacing. The good news is the more unconditional love I've rested into and the more self love I have as an adult. I am able to care for the adolescent part of me that wishes to use drugs and to avoid the discomfort. And now what I and I teach people to do is use their wise, compassionate, loving adult selves to nurture the adolescent part of them that wants to use substances that is arising. What I often say is that part of you fills your consciousness. What we want to do is create a lot of space for that part to be there, but not fill your consciousness. We want the consciousness to be filled with the present moment where just some of us is coming up. Because if you're dominated by a part of you that wants to use substances, you're more than likely just going to do the thing because it's really hard to uh, ignore a big presence. But when you have spaciousness and that part comes up, you can see it and you tend to it. And after psychedelic experiences, you have to put in the work. This is where the integration and life work comes. You need mentors, therapists, communities, and new practices like the ones I'm talking about to put into place every day so that those habits, uh, old habits dissolve and the new habits, because the new habits will ultimately feel better. They will always feel better than the old habits. Mm. They might not be as satisfying. You know, try give up smoking. That apple is not as satisfying, but it does feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Perhaps you could get into some more specifics and resources to answer answer Daniel's question, which is if you have specific themes or relationships in your life that you need that you know you need to work on, but you're just not quite sure, um, what would you recommend as a first step to making significant progress work? I'm gonna read that again. Yeah, sorry. It's okay. It's there in the chat and in the yeah, yeah, I'm it. Uh -huh. I gotta say from my non-dual my non-dual perspective is that you we're always gonna have these circumstances, family relationships, work, everything. It to me they're not actually that different. The the circumstances are different, but where you have to be in relating to those might not be different. So I spend a lot of time in the beginning of my treatment with people, helping them build a relationship to themselves so that when they start interacting with those, um, the context of their life, work, relationships, trauma, memory, they have a new relationship to themselves, which they're going through the treatment. 
Do you see, I just found it so backwards to just start going into trauma treatment or relationship building when people don't even know how to relate to themselves or they don't even love themselves. How are we supposed to help heal when the most, the deepest wound is that which makes us hate or loathe ourselves? So I don't know if I'm answering you specifically, but what I say is start with the relationship to yourself and then use that model of relating to external circumstances, including people, memories, events. Mm -hmm. And do you have any like favorite uh, apps or books or podcasts? Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh my gosh. How much time do we got? Uh, In <laughs> Insight Timer. That's the app everybody uses when they work with me because it has my teacher, Richard Miller, Tara Brock. I'm in uh, uh, the lineage of Jack Cornfield and James Perez, one of the lineages. So Insight Timer. Um, again, Heart Math was a good one, but what are, oh my gosh. Um, what are we talking? Oh, uh, I Rest, Yoga Nidra practice. So I Rest, Yoga Nidra. That's Richard Miller. Uh, that's my direct teacher. He teaches veterans this non-dual meditation. A lot of my teaching comes from 13, 14 plus years studying with him. Um, I'm also been mentored under Cass Cassandra Veaton of, um, and she's been my mentor. So I'm presenting what my work is, but of course I've been influenced by so many amazing people in, in the world. Untethered Soul, but actually Chris, what I really like is his surrender experiment. I use that one a lot to help people say yes to life. Um, the books, The Wise Heart by Jack Kornfield. That's a wonderful book uh, by Jack Kornfield, The Wise Heart. Pema Chodron, Welcoming the Unwelcome. It gives you, it teaches you how to have relationship with things that are very difficult. And you're welcome, Daniel. Yeah. Hey, thanks for sharing those. I've been getting a lot of Sam Harris's oh. Waking Up. Um, it's a good mindfulness based and some different conversations he has enjoyed quite a bit. And if other people have uh, things they really enjoy apps, books, and on this topic, you want to drop them in the chat, feel free to. Yeah. Any last questions and thoughts yourself or Allison or, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're right at the hour here. So I don't know if you want to say any closing words here. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but I will say we have a lot of information about ketamine on our website, as well as other psychedelics and psychedelic experiences, as well as groups and practitioners you can find, which would, I think, cover some of the remaining questions nope. <laughs> here. But if you would uh, say any words to wrap us up, uh, we'd be happy to close the session. Yeah, I wrap. I, okay. I usually. Oh, okay, sorry. it was really fun way to experience. Uh, go ahead. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, my last words are basically what I say on every podcast: um, that you are worth all the effort in the world. You are precious. This life is precious. It passes very swiftly. Uh, we often don't have time to do all the things we are longing to. So start now and take care of yourselves. And my agent would like me to ask you, please follow me on Instagram. <laughs> and thank Fabulous. you all so much. Yeah, let, let me drop the links again for you all. And uh, thank you so much for your time. And for everyone that joined today, we will share the video and some of these resources and links for you. Uh, we appreciate you being here. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. All right. Thank all right, you so take much. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, everybody.